uh, introduce you a bit. So our uh, next speaker is Stefan Link from Rice University in the United States in Texas. Um, Stefan did his uh, diploma or the master's equivalent in Germany um, in, at the Technical University of Braunschweig in 1996 on time-resolved absorption and fluorescent spectroscopy uh, on, on various more molecular systems, and then uh, moved for his PhD to the Georgia Institute of Technology um, to do um, uh, studies on silver and uh, gold nanorods, uh, silver nanodots and um, uh, silver nanorods uh, in the group of Professor uh, El Sayed, uh, very famously. Uh, continued his uh, postdoctoral research there as well in the same group, um, uh, including also um, uh, a second position as a research scientist, and then was for uh, three years, as far as I see, at the University of Texas in Austin in the group of Paul Barbara um, until he finally moved uh, to Rice University in uh, 2006, uh, where he's now a uh, professor for chemistry. I think many of you um, know um, Stefan for his extended contributions to the field of plasmonics and spectroscopy, nanophotonics, single molecule spectroscopy. Um, he has um, achieved or he has obtained a lot of awards that I uh, don't want to read to you all, but um, um, there are several awards from the NSF, um, also outstanding academic achievement awards from Rice University and so on and so on. So you uh, certainly know his well-cited papers uh, from the field of plasmonics. And then I have talked enough uh, for the introduction and give the word to Stefan. Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, I'm blushing. Um, but first of all, thank you for, for having me. Thanks to uh, Sebastian, to Frank, to Michelle for uh, organizing this photothermal seminar series uh, and really um, being great mentors and leaders in the field. And, and I really appreciate that, uh, what you're doing here and everything you've done in the community and really trying to be inclusive and welcoming to new people, uh, which I, uh, and maybe not anymore, but I remember when I was, and so thank you for all that. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a lot about plasmonics. Um, I'm hoping to get to the title of my talk here in terms of temperature uh, distributions on the nanoscale, but I do want to give a big picture um, overview in terms of how we got there, um, how we got into photothermal imaging and what we're really interested in. Um, and with that, I'll have my typical what is a plasmon slide. I don't think I need to really explain uh, a surface plasmon to, to all of you. People in photothermal imaging certainly have used, made use of uh, strong absorbing properties of, of the surface plasmon, but I do want to point out, and this might be cliche again, um, that we always worry about absorption and scattering. And so this is this famous example that has been overused about the, sur the Surgus cup, uh, where you see a uh, reflection <clears throat> of scattering in green and absorption in red. And, and below that, uh, let me see if I have a pointer. Below here are uh, me theory calculations, absorption and scattering cross sections. And I, I wanna point this out because in plasmonics, both of them are extremely important. Obviously, uh, for photothermal imaging, you want to take advantage of, of the heating of the nanoparticle and the surrounding, uh, same for photothermal cancer therapy. But the scattering as an antenna effect is clearly important in spectroscopy as well. Surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy one being one of the, the more famous examples, but really any surface-enhanced spectroscopy. And so as, as somebody in the field of plasmonics, you have to worry about, you should worry about absorption and scattering. And, and that's kind of how we started into this field of photothermal imaging. I'm gonna give one more background, quick background slide um, that, that says really the same thing, that absorption and scattering matters, but it matters as a function of size. So as you go from smaller particles, absorption dominates, scattering is weaker. Um, if you go bigger than all, then scattering becomes the dominant contribution and absorption is very small. And that's obviously also the, the reason why photothermal imaging is so powerful that we can see small particles and, and not just photothermal imaging, but all interference microscopy techniques. Um, and the scaling of absorption and, and scattering uh, can be at least for nanoparticles below 100 nanometer approximated as uh, the volume for the, um, for the absorption term and as uh, the volume squared for the scattering term. And so um, at small sizes, absorption dominates, at uh, large sizes, scattering dominates. And so we, early on, when I first started, we set out to, to measure this dependence, this comparison 
of uh, absorption and scattering of nanoparticles, plasmonic nanoparticles as a function of size. And so what we've done was to, to take a typical dark field scattering setup and put a laser through a dark field ob objective and then uh, use photothermal heterodyne imaging. And I'm, I'm pointing out specifically this reference uh, by uh, Bram Lunis, but obviously everybody else in the field, Frank and, and Michelle, et cetera, um, uh, should be listed here too. I, I did want to point this work out because there's a, there's a little story behind it. And I think Lauren Cornier is on this call. And so I want to give a shout out to him uh, and a big thanks because he was in sabbatical at Rice University with Bruce Weissman um, looking at carbon nanotubes. And I was setting up my lab in temporary space. And, and I said, oh, I got my instrument going. I got two lasers in there. How do I, how do I get this photothermal signal going? And, and, uh, and once, we, once I had the two lasers in the microscope, it was actually not that difficult with Lauren um, to get this going. And so big thanks to him. That's how we got started, really from the person who um, pioneered the technique. Um, so we, we did, what we did was that we took samples of nanoparticles on the, on the left here, are the mean diameters that we know from TEM characterization. Uh, we took dark field scattering images, photothermal images, and then correlated SEM. This is all in air, so this is not optimum conditions, um, but this way we can correlate all three on three different microscopes, or probably two different microscopes, um, the SEM being, being separate, um, but in identification marks and, and being able to really correlate particle scattering to particle absorption to particle size uh, and, and do this for um, quite a few particles. Then from the images, we get the intensity. So this is all just done at one wavelength, scattering at one wavelength, photothermal imaging at one wavelength, all at 532. That overlaps with the plasma and for spherical particles. And here's the pendants that we are seeing for the scattering. So um, each color is a different batch of nanoparticles with a different mean size I've given on the previous slide. Uh, and the, the red um, dots are are uncorrelated. We don't know the size. Um, that they're basically averaged together. The black line is me theory. And you see that this initial increase actually fits really well with the volume squared dependence. And then it tails off. Uh, the scatter gets uh, larger. And this is because the particles are really not true spheres. They, they don't look, uh, if you look closely, we approximated them as an average size by taking the long and the short axis of whatever object we had, as long as it wasn't a nanorod. Uh, and here's the comparison to absorption. Um, and note that this is on, on a little different scale. So this is blown up in terms of scatter a little bit. Um, but again, we follow up to 100 nanometer, roughly a volume dependence. Um, and then it becomes a little bit more complicated. And, and really what this taught us, not just to confirm the scaling of absorption and, and scattering with size, this is that, that single wavelength imaging is limited, right? As the particle size becomes bigger, uh, you deviate from a perfect sphere. And me theory is not really the right theory then to, to look at a highly faceted nanoparticles. And, and you don't even have to just go to, um, to spheres, but, but obviously rods and other structures. There is a strong shape dependence. And so looking at just one single wavelength in a spectrum that changes from particle to particle is, is maybe not the way to go. Um, but that's, uh, single particles is only one of the areas that, that I've been, that my group has been interested in. We've really been interested uh, in a bigger picture in line shape engineering. So using plasmons to couple them together and go beyond the single particle uh, where we uh, can control size and shape and modulate the plasmon. But through near field coupling, you can change the plasmon resonance too. And so this is real old work from Joachim Krenz group. You take a dimer, this is nanofabricated, you make the distance between the dimer smaller and you redshift the plasmon. And, and one way of looking at this is, is obviously, couple, there are many different ways, coupled oscillators, but I'm gonna try to briefly um, uh, go over this plasmon hybridization theory that uh, Peter Nordlander at Rice pioneered. And the idea being that you have plasmons, two plasmons coming together, just like atomic orbitals forming molecular orbitals. If the plasmons are in phase, so both of these oscillations go in the same direction, it gives the bonding mode. If they're anti-parallel, you create an anti-bonding mode that's higher in energy because charges repel each other in the gap. Uh, and then the question though is, is that we get, we have two individual particles, we get two modes, but we only see a redshift. Well, uh, this is because the antibonding mode is dark. It has a total dark, uh, dipole moment of zero. 
Uh, if you look at this charge distribution, that's a cartoon, but you can actually calculate this. And the bonding mode is bright. This one is in lower energy. And so, so therefore you see the redshift. Now, this uh, perfect picture, of course, holds only to, uh, to an extent, because as soon as you make one particle shape not quite spherical, or one particle bigger, smaller, you have symmetry breaking, and you can allow other optically uh, dark modes to become bright as well. And so it becomes complex uh, quickly. Um, but this is really a, a big part of what we've been looking at in the link lab of plasmon coupling and how does heterogeneity play a role when we are looking at coupled structures and their overall collective response. Now I have a cup. I have just two slides to give you an idea <clears throat> why I'm stressing this and what we've done, and then come back to photothermal imaging. Um, one of the one of the examples that we've looked at more recently. Uh, and this is cartoons, but this is actually real data, uh, twisted nano dumbbells. Uh, if you bring, if you make them twisted, if you're not completely parallel, they actually become chiral. Uh, this was an ensemble uh, sample from the Liz Mazan group. In an ensemble, you have equal contributions of left-handed and right-handed enantiomers, and so the CD spectrum is zero. But if you look on the single particle level, um, then, then you can distinguish uh, left-handed and right-handed enantiomers. Um, and that is really uh, one of the, the, the strength of doing all this on a single particle, as I probably don't have to advertise to you too much. Um, and a little bit older example of what we've done in terms of plasmon coupling. Uh, and this is, again, still just with scattering. So that's where I maybe should say this. This was all done for, for dark field scattering, um, is to make chains of nanoparticles and look at their um, collective optical response. This is a, an imperfect chain of nanospheres. Uh, the experiment, the simulations that are possible because we have the correlated SEM imaging. And so that's it's usually how we operate um, in terms of making sample, measuring, uh, and then doing the simulations. And the idea here was, was as, as a starting point uh, to get to big structures where you can do plasmon wave guiding. Um, and, and so these are, these are long wire-like assemblies of nanoparticles. So these are densely packed. Uh, and what we do here is fluorescence imaging. So it's coated with a fluorophore. Um, the nanostructure becomes fluorescence. It's overcoated. It's enhanced. We excite with the laser. So we pump light into, have the plasmon propagate. And over time, there's bleaching going on. There's bleaching going on where the laser is. But when we take the difference be between before and after, then we actually see that there's uh, bleaching larger than the spot size of the laser because of plasmon propagation down this wire. And we can get plasmon propagation distances of, a, of almost 10 microns that are comparable to a wire and even bend light around a corner. So this is, these are silver nanowires and this is a 90 degree bend, which you couldn't do with a solid nanowire. And so, so this is how we got into, into um, coupled nanostructures. And then a couple of examples of what we've done from wave guiding to chirality. Um, but I want to point out, because the last couple of slides were specifically on, on scattering, that for, for the studies, and I can't go into too much detail, on the wave guiding, we found actually that if we excite into modes that are away from the close to single particle resonance, but, but more in the coupled mode, uh, is this when we, when we see most uh, effective wave guiding. So we don't want to be on the single particle resonance when it comes to uh, near field coupling and plasma propagation. And I'm gonna make that point again uh, in terms of uh, absorption and scattering, which wavelengths we maybe wanna excite. So for wave guiding, not the single particle resonance, but red shifted modes, dark modes that, that are collective. Okay. So coming back to, uh, hopefully this is, a, this is a little bit of an overview and, and well, I'll come back quickly here to uh, photothermal imaging. And uh, our first attempt in photothermal imaging was with these self-assembled uh, rings of, of nanoparticles. So these were kind of messy, but they, uh, they were an interesting system from my colleague Eugene Zubogreff, um, where if you blow this up, they are just assemblies of of uh, <coughs> nanoparticles, and basically they're, they're coffee wings. And, and so you see on the, this is the SEM structure. This is way too complicated as we realized back in 2007, uh, but we tried it anyway. Uh, and this is uh, the dark field scattering. And if we um, now use the technique I, uh, the, well, the photothermal imaging technique I described you for the single particles, uh, really the same setup and reflection mode uh, with certain pump wavelengths. <coughs> 
then uh, we can not only image um, scattering, and, but we can also image absorption, right? And so in a particular, um, what I want to point out here is, is we're taking a bandpass filter and taking a scattering image, uh, we're making this polarized. And so depending on the polarizer, um, the sections of the ring that align with the polarization always light up. So uh, it's really a local effect. The plasmons couple, but they don't couple entirely around the ring, as I said. The rings are way too big for that. And so it's much more of a local effect, uh, but it is strong coupling. Uh, in absorption, you see, you see similar behavior, and this is done with a uh, 785 nanometer laser. So this is also away from the single particle resonance in a coupled mode. Um, and so we wanted to analyze this a little bit more, uh, apart from visualizing that we have scattering and absorption, can we say something about the relative strength? And this is what's, uh, what I'm going to show here. Let me explain uh, uh, some theory we've done first. So we've taken a segment of the, of the ring, we digitized that and made a model, and then used generalized me theory to calculate the absorption and scattering spectrum. And so the the scattering spectrum is this blue line and the absorption is the magenta for this particular segment. And, and as I said, the segment is all that matters. Um, and what you see is, is that scattering goes up at long wavelengths, absorption actually tails down is, is stronger at shorter wavelengths close to the um, single particle resonance. In scattering, we can take the spectrum, of course, we can take a dark field spectrum easily. And the dark field spectrum is not too bad in terms of a match to this local structure right here. Uh, in absorption back then, the only thing we could do is at certain wavelengths, uh, try to image. And that's what we've done right here. We imaged um, at 514, 675, and 785. So basically around this wavelengths right here, um, so in absorption, the, the magenta line, this wavelengths, this wavelengths, and then 785 right around here. Um, we've tried to express this as a cross section by comparing our signal to uh, single particles that we image individually and, and by dividing the imaging spot by roughly the number of particles present. But the, the absolute values don't matter so much. What matters more is, is that what we see indeed is, is that at 514, we are equally strong or even stronger than 785, which is roughly matching with our absorption spectrum. Not completely, but, but the point being that, that absorption doesn't go up just like scattering when you go to a longer wavelength coupled mode. Um, and, and while I wanna put a positive spin on, on it saying, well, we sort of see what, what we're predicting, um, it really pointed out our limitations, right? Um, so my first conclusion is absorption of coupled structures is strong as at the, uh, or is, is stronger close to the single particle resonance. But then really the, the, the conclusion of the slide is that absorption spectroscopy is needed. So beyond imaging, we need to do spectroscopy. Okay, and so this is where our very, very talented postdoc, uh, Mustafa uh, Yurumas, who was actually a, a PhD student with Michelle, so thanks Michelle, um, uh, came to my lab and we, we invested into a white light laser and built um, an absorption um, spectrometer, basically, and a photothermal single particle absorption spectrometer. And let me, let me take you through this real briefly. Um, instead of having uh, a CW fixed wavelength laser, we have a Fianio white light laser with a acousto-optical modulator as the pump. Uh, we're taking a Heaney or any other laser, I'll talk about this uh, in a second, as the probe. And we're doing this in transmission geometry. Now, um, uh, and this is pretty important. Uh, I'll come back to this just in a second. Here are the wavelengths that are selected from the AOTF from, from that laser. And so we can get actually even further beyond a thousand nanometers up to 1500 nanometers. That's really the advantage of this white light laser compared to maybe a dye laser. Um, the, we do this in transmission because then our probe beam can be lowered in terms of power. We keep in mind, uh, I'm going to show you some absorption spectra of single particles, but I want to get back to, um, to the coupled structures. And in order to, to not melt coupled structures, I really need to have low power uh, or lower power. And so we do this in a transmission geometry. Um, and because the coupled structures technically absorb everywhere, we're not really off resonant anymore with the probe. We just have to take that into account uh, because we have to probe somewhere. Okay, so then how do we do this? Um, we take an image, uh, we, we select the particle, and we scan the white light laser. Uh, 
And then we also go to the gold film, that's a marker grid, so that we can find the particles and uh, <clears throat> take a spectrum there too. And we do that because in between are changing wavelengths, we are not re readjusting the focus, we're not changing the collimation, et cetera, and we're not using a refractive uh, objective. But by doing this, we actually measure, we measure two things, the gold nanoparticle spectrum, the gold film spectrum. We know the gold film spectrum from simulations. We divide one by the other to get a correction factor, and that correction factor then gives us the spectrum that's true. So we, so we basically do a background correction just like you would do in a dark field uh, spectroscopy. Um, so this is uh, a little bit more in detail in terms of the technique. Uh, we looked at this. Uh, in terms of the optical resolution, the beam sizes get a little worse because obviously the fiber or the, the fiber laser doesn't have as clean of a mode than a CW, or we didn't necessarily clean that up. Um, and so our signal to noise goes down a little bit too, but, but only by a factor of two, maybe two and a half, uh, and something that we can live with because this wasn't aimed to go at the smallest possible particles, uh, although we could measure a spectrum of 20 nanometer particles and <clears throat> also show that at least for, um, for these structures, the medium determines the, the photothermal signal strength. Um, so to apply this now to a couple of structures before I come back to, to um, coupled um, structures is uh, to show you an absorption and a scattering spectrum of a sphere. So this is correlated absorption and scattering. Um, and you see that me theory, even though it's an approximation, fits pretty well to our spectra. And there's slight differences between absorption and scattering that we've already, I've already pointed out in the simulations in the first couple of slides. And, and to make this a little bit more challenging, because certainly um, um, Ram Lunas and co-workers have done similar photothermal spectroscopy of a single particle with, um, <clears throat> of a single sphere uh, with a dye laser, uh, we extended this to nano rods. And so here are our experiments for for nanorods, the scattering, the absorption, the correlated, all the same particle, and these are simulations based on the input of the SEM. And we really capture some important features. We capture that at short, way, at low aspect ratios, absorption is blue shifted, and then this shift sort of goes away, uh, it changes. And the relative ratio between uh, longitudinal mode and transverse mode also changes. And this is well captured in the spectra as well as uh, in, uh, in the simulations. And so, in the, and so we, we trust that, that uh, this correction procedure we're doing to acquire the, um, the um, photothermal spectra works well. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this. Um, and come to a couple structures because I really also want to make sure I get to the end. Um, and that is, is that we, we then looked at these Fano structures. So these are structures where you have a central disk and outer ring, uh, and you see actually interesting interference effect and scattering. I'll show this to you in a second, but let's focus on this, on this disk first. Here's the predicted simulated scattering and absorption, the dipole resonance and absorption you see also quadrupole resonance. And then when we measure this, we can recapture the absorption and the absorption being different from the scattering. And so we have confidence that, that for these structures that are, show, that are made by even lithography, uh, we can measure this. And here's the situation for the final structure now, so the ring and the particles together. And you see this interference dip here. This is the final resonance. Um, the absorption is just tailing off. There's not really an interference dip. Uh, and when we measure this, well, when we measure this, we get, we get reasonable agreement um, with, with our predictions. Obviously, there are slight differences in manufacturing this disk, et cetera. And on the, on the right that I skipped over, you have the modes. So the bright mode here is the one where all dipoles are in phase. So this is a positive negative charge and they're all oscillating together. And here's where the central disk oscillate opposite phase from the outer ring. And that these two modes interfering gives you the final resonance. Um, now we can decompose this a little bit by actually not just measuring the final uh, structure, but then also measuring the single particle and the ring individually. And so now you see what the structures look like done by EBM lithography. Um, the disk uh, that I showed you on the previous slide, but not normalized now, is much weaker than actually the outer ring. This is coupled, but this is the outer ring. Um, and when you add these together, you don't really see much of a difference to what the final structure is. And what that really shows is that most of the absorption comes from the outer ring and actually is localized on the single particles. And in theory, 
uh, agrees with us in this assessment. And what, what this tells us, and this is why we did it, is to understand where maximum um, hot electron generation occurs. So these final structures have been, have been introduced to, um, to really uh, provide hot electrons. And the idea then is, is that, or the, the message is, you can't just look at the scattering spectrum and say from the scattering spectrum where you should excite in order to generate the most hot electrons. And in fact, uh, while sensing might be uh, maximized at the final resonance, most efficient absorption is actually at shorter wavelengths below the final resonance. I'll put this up one more time here. Final resonance being around 800 or, or 750, and really maximum absorption is at 650. Uh, and so absorption and scattering, really two complementary important optical responses in plasmonics that, that should be uh, looked at individually. So, okay. Um, I want to switch gears now and hopefully have enough time. I haven't been cut off so far. Um, and that is, uh, is to introduce what, uh, what a great colleague of mine, David Marciello, has proposed some time ago. And that is, is that you actually uh, can um, manipulate with these Fano interferences local temperature distribution. So, so far we've only measured the spectrum. Um, but with these couple structures, what his group um, pioneered and first simulated is when you take a similar final structure, not the same, this is an assembly of four rods. It has one mode that's all in phase, and then you have one mode that is anti-parallel between the central, what they call antenna, and the rods. And here again, you see the final resonance dip and scattering and absorption, you actually see a maximum. And what they predict, this is based on their calculations that they can do uh, uh, from, from inventing really uh, a, a temperature DDA method, so discretizing elements and calculating the temperature and, and uh, solving the, the heat equation, um, is to, to calculate the temperature, the temperature for each of the rods. And so what you see here is, is that um, depending on where you excite, you actually raise the temperature of, of the antenna, the middle particles, differently than the rod. And here you reverse it. And so you can see this in, in this simulation right here where the top one, I think, is the, is the heat power absorbed. Uh, and so at 8.30, at the longer wavelengths, you make the rods preferentially hot. And then at the shorter wavelengths, you make the antenna preferentially hot. And these are the, the temperature distribution. So heat power absorbed and temperature. Temperature is washed out a little bit because of diffusion, um, but heat diffusion. But you can still see a signature that you can, in principle, localize temperature gradients on the nanoscale with coupled structures by selectively exciting modes that only arise because you, you, you do couple the plasmons together. And this is, this is really um, uh, the, one of the, I talked about line shape engineering for a couple structures, but now we're getting into trying to probe this temperature profile on the nanoscale. And so our first uh, collaboration together with David and also Kelly Willits at Temple um, was to look at heterodimers. These are, 100 uh, by 50 times plus uh, 250 by 50 nanorods with different gaps right here done by EBM lithography. So they're quite large. They're on the order of uh, 360, 70 nanometers, depending on, on the gap size. And we have two modes and maybe, uh, I mean, this is, this is our uh, extinction experiment absorption uh, and simulation, but I, I want to, I can pick any of these curves. And so let me, let me just pick this one down here. The, coupled mode that is in phase, the bonding mode, is this long wavelength mode. And, and that's what's called lambda plus. The shorter wavelength mode here is the anti-bonding mode. Keep in mind, they're not a homodimer, they're heterodimer. So the anti-bonding mode not, now is active. It's not complete dark. And so the question was, if we excite specifically into the bonding mode at the longer wavelengths or the anti-bonding mode, what what happens to our point spread functions? What happens to our photothermal imaging? And this is what you see. Uh, you see that, and so as a cartoon down here, is the long rod, here's the short rod. This is the point spread function profile uh, or cross section. This is the point spread function itself. As I go from short wavelengths, exciting mostly the short wavelengths, uh, shorter nano rod, um, I bias at the shorter nano rod, and then this bias moves over to the longer nano rod. And this is persistent 
not just with a large gap where you almost could say these particles are uncoupled, but it also comes about by this 50 nanometer gap where they're strongly coupled. I have biasing on the small, if a, a small nano rod, if I, if I excite short wavelengths, I have biasing on the right when I excite at the long wavelengths. And so then it really took um, calculations from David's group and putting all this together and in understanding what this means for the underlying temperature profiles. And, and I'm going to focus only on the 50 nanometer gap because otherwise it would, would be too much data. Uh, one thing we realized right away um, that actually made things more complicated is, is that <clears throat> the initial results David was um, uh, producing was for white field excitation. Um, but our, our instrument still works in the sample scanning mode. And so they implemented a code where they solved the temperature profile, so this TDDA method, but with a focused laser spot as you move the laser spot across your structure. So you're sitting either at the bonding mode and you move the laser across, or you're sitting at the anti-bonding wavelengths and you're also moving the laser across. And what you see is, is that when you excite at the bonding mode, even though the total differences between the left and the, the right rod change, you always have a hotter nano rod on the right. So you, at the long wavelengths, you preferentially excite the, the long rod. At the anti-bonding short wavelengths, um, the, <clears throat> the situation is a little bit more complex. It starts out when it's exactly on top. Um, it is the longer rod, but then eventually the shorter rod can be heated more as well. The, the differences are much smaller, but it, it shows that what, uh, what we're seeing should in principle be due to heat localization on one nano rod versus the other, depending on the wavelengths that we excite into coupled modes. Uh, and taking this temperature distribution and then actually using it as an input for doing imaging, uh, point spread function imaging of photothermal signals, um, we, they came up with this um, graph right here. So an experiment our dimer excited at the bonding mode is biased towards the longer rod. Um, and we see the same thing in simulations. And when we go to the anti-bonding mode, we are biasing the shorter rod. And this is the, the black line here. And that's true in experiment and uh, in, in simulation as well. The reason why the blue line is actually higher is because when you couple the modes together, the oscillator strength of the short rod goes down. And then if you just look at the comparison, so these two are comparison measurements for the short rod and the long rod only, the, the short rod actually absorbs more um, at shorter wavelengths for the single structure compared to the dimer. And so this is, this is putting it all together, our experimental point spread functions, the temperature distribution calculations, and then uh, comparing uh, the simulated point spread functions. Okay, so if I, if I have time, I have two more slides. Um, we took this now below the diffraction limit. So these structures were big. <clears throat> we could visually see the point spread function moving around. The question is, could we do this with smaller structures? And so uh, we fabricated again by EBM lithography, trimers, so two on top, one on the bottom. And this is a mode decomposition, a normal mode decomposition that you can do in plasmonics or, or even group, group theory in principle, um, and shows us three different coupled modes. And uh, when you look at the individual, when you look at the absorption spectrum, which is the black one right here, you see the longest order mode all are in phase, and then you see two other modes. Uh, interestingly though, again, if you scan, so if you sit at different positions close to the dimer, you get different absorption spectra. In particular, this lambda three mode can only really be excited when you sit off to the right of the dimer. So this is the same idea as what I showed you on the previous slide in terms of scanning the sample slash the laser across. Um, <clears throat> based on these beam positions where we're at uh, as input and these modes, uh, David's group calculates a temperature distributions. So longest wavelengths mode, the top two nanoparticles are always hotter. The next mode, there are some where the bottom one is hotter and some of them where they're almost equal. And then the third mode is a little bit more complicated. I won't go into this because Frank already turned on his video. And so I do have one, one more slide left. Uh, and here's the experiment. <clears throat> what we see in experiment, here's the SEM um, for, for both structures that <clears throat> we always measure a sphere or a disc and a nano trimer together because we were worried about aberrations. 
Uh, and so in one image, we always see both of them. And what we see is, is that our point spread function, independent where we excite 700 or 800, for the disk is most spherical, We're as good as we can get it in the microscope. But when we go to the trimer, we actually see changes to the point spread function. There's some asymmetry in the point spread function that uh, is, this is the fit, this is the experiment that is not seen in our disk. And in order to really be confident, we divide the disk values or use it as a standard compared to the trimer. And when we do this, we can, and I promise this is the last slide, um, we can calculate, we can histogram forward that have maximum values that are corrected for by the disk at 700 nanometer excitation, 800. You see this asymmetry uh, in the point spec in the forward half maximum, especially for 700, but then also for 800 a little bit. And this, it was then modeled by David's group and, and uh, <clears throat> this is the last piece that hopefully I can get done in, in 30 seconds. And that is, is that the modeling um, was to basically scan this excitation wavelengths. But then what we're plotting is the difference to the lambda max. And so this is trying to replicate these distributions as a function of excitation wavelengths and plot it where zero is the lambda max of the resonance. Um, the, the data points in here that actually match pretty well are 700, 800 nanometer fixed but each trimer is slightly different. It has a slightly different resonance maxima. So we're basically scanning the resonance maxima through heterogeneity of the structure itself. And, and we really recapture this, uh, this asymmetry. And the symmetry comes simply from the fact that, that we're heating in an asymmetric way, either the top particles or the bottom particle. And that's, that's really what the end of the story is here. Um, that we with wavelength selective coupled mode excitation, we can control nanoscale temperature profiles. There's a big uh, shout out to the group, but especially Kelly and David, uh, Claire and Harrison, and then uh, Stephen is a phenomenal postdoc, and Ali and Jesse are current members, and I shut up and probably was over time. I apologize for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, for this nice overview of the uh, clusters of for coupled particles is beautiful results. I think there will be certainly also questions um, uh, about that. So I have a very quick question uh, about the the point first function with this uh, couple uh, three rod structure. So it, it, typically the the point first function of photothermal will be determined by the the thermal lens profile and then the the probe. Uh, yeah, probe wavelength. And so if I see the three structures, so then there will be much complex uh, thermal lens profile because it will be uh, depending on the which position of the particle is uh, yeah, heated up. So does this uh, PSF, it's, I mean, you mentioned that it depends on the resonance of this uh, individual particle, but also does it really uh, reflect the uh, the structure of this uh, uh, aggregate. So if it's defined, differently organized these structures, then the PSF will be, will be different or, or is it will be uh, similar? Um, okay, uh, I probably went too fast. Um, um, that's a great question, Zubas. Uh, I mean, it certainly depends on the size of the underlying structure to some extent too, right? I mean, if, as if I go away from a point dipole to, to bigger structures, um, what we're trying to say is, is that depending on, on where your beam position, so this is the structure, but if this is the beam, Gaussian beam, then of course it expands partially covering the structure, right? So this is just a position marker, but the, the laser beam is, is bigger, right? Uh, and in fact, this is sort of uh, illustrating the, the outline of the Gaussian laser beam. So if I had a different position, then I can excite a different mode or a different contribution to the total absorption. And that different contribution creates a temperature profile that depends on the position and the mode, meaning the wavelengths and, and, and the position. And based on this underlying uh, temperature profile, we are saying we are shaping the point spread function, that we determine that the point spread function is influenced by this uh, temperature distribution in the nanorod assembly. Does that, does that mostly answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, then other questions. Then I, I would have a question. So for these Fano structures, 
um, uh, what is the redistribution of the scattered intensity over the whole solid angle? If you measure at different wavelengths, are the different wavelengths scattered into different directions? And, and how do you consider that if you measure dark field scattering spectra or whatever? Yeah, so, so the, that's a great point. I mean, the, the final resonance is, is really only seen in, in certain directions. And so, so it's, it, it was, it was a, an okay comparison, I think, what we've done in terms of absorption and scattering. But the, the scattering spectrum, more so than the absorption, uh, in my opinion, is shaped by the numerical aperture of the dark field system. And so if, and that's what we, that's the only thing we did. We didn't integrate the solid angle. We didn't, we didn't do Fourier imaging, a Fourier plane imaging or anything like this. Um, mm. So the, 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 the hallmark of this final resonance seen in scattering will depend on the structure itself, but also on the collection angle. And, and, uh, and so if we were to integrate it over everything, it'd be an interesting question how that would change compared to, to mm -hmm. the absorption. Um, the, the point I was trying to make mostly is, is that uh, fauna, the, the fauna structures when they first came out, and mostly I uh, asked uh, my colleagues, Peter and Naomi and, and others have, have worked on this, Harald Giesen, of course, um, <clears throat> were, were thinking about refractive index sensing under certain conditions where you would just see the, the change in this resonance dip. Uh, mm -hmm. And then later on, in terms of hot electron uh, generation. And my point really I want to make here is, is that the lots of structures and plasmonics are measured by scattering uh, mm -hmm. and, and potentially measured under certain conditions, like just like we've done with a certain yeah. NA. Mm -hmm. And that that information by itself does tells you very little about the absorption of the structure. And the absorption is the relevant measure in order to generate hot electrons. And that's really the message I wanted to bring across. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, other questions for Stefan? Either in the chat or uh, speak up directly. No other questions? So uh, uh, maybe you can tell me again, maybe I missed it. Uh, oh, Michelle has a question then I rather prefer the question by Michel. Well, it's, it's uh, thanks. Uh, hello, Stefan, nice to see you. Hi, um, I was wondering at the beginning of your talk, you showed this uh, um, you know, absorption spectra and photothermal, and I had the impression that, okay, you mentioned this uh, possible shift between scattering and absorption. I, I, I had the impression that the photothermal spectra were less absorbing uh, during, uh, at the interband transition than, the, than expected. Is that, is that true? Or, and, and if it is true, how do you explain that? Yeah, so, so, uh, so in the rods, I think we, we felt like we did this okay. In the spheres, this is sort of this, these couple of data points. Yeah, it, it was mentioned in the about, sphere because, of course, yeah. for the rods, you have the, the yeah. transverse. Yeah. So, but for the spheres? Is it... I, I've been asked this many times, and, and I don't have a good explanation. We never went back and tried to really hammer out what's happening at the shorter wavelengths. It's, it's where, certainly where we lose a lot of power, and I don't know if our correction is the problem or if you really have less absorption of, I mean, um, I, honestly, I, I, I didn't want to interpret anything into it without doing any further measurements, but, but uh, you're absolutely right that this is something that, that might be real, but in the, in the, in the, these were the first results, and when we measured the, the rods, we were more confident. Obviously, we, sh we were still, this was still high, so this is still 450 or so, 460, um, and so it seemed like everything was okay there. Why, why we had a problem here, I don't know, but it's, it's a good point. I, it could be. I mean, it would be worthwhile looking into it again, but we kind of moved away from... from it, this could be real because I, I think we had something similar, if, if okay. I recall. Right. Yeah. Well, then no, if, if, if you're telling me may, I should look into it, I should do it. <laughs> okay. Maybe if I can add uh, yeah. to this discussion, could it be, Stefan, that uh, the difference here between modeling and... Uh, the experiment is because of interband transitions that uh, you in, in which you may not account for, and then uh, you overestimate the heating. Would this be a possible explanation? Well, I mean, I, I mean, the interband transitions are accounted for in me theory, right? I mean, this is what this tail right here is. So it's it's just me theory. Me theory does produce interband transitions because you feed in the the entire dielectric function. Um, but I mean, yeah, I. I mean, I think that I, can't, I really can't answer the question and I, uh, this discussion certainly helps me to, to maybe uh, be motivated to look into it again. I, I think in general, 
um, paying attention to to plasmon absorption versus interband absorption is an interesting point, right? I mean, where do you heat more efficiently at the plasmon or at the interband? Because because the interband transitions are not necessarily bad. I mean, if you want to generate heat, um, they're certainly not a bad location. But but yes, I I on you. This is you definitely got me with this question. I I uh, based on these couple data points, there I might be something. Go ahead. Yes. Please go ahead, uh, Matthias. Oh, hi, uh, thank you for the uh, nice data and sharing the nice data. I have a question regarding uh, the heterodimers. I was wondering what is the dominant heat transport channel that uh, equilibrates the temperatures? Uh, is that heat conduction through the substrate in your case or, or does it depend on the distance between the dimers? But the, the, there's still, I didn't say this, there's still glycerol on top of the, of the dimers. And so even though that's, that's not fast heat conduction, eventually they will equilibrate based on a thermal conduction or heat transfer through the glycerol. Mm -hmm. So that, that, in that medium, it just helps us to, to have a more homogeneous medium. The substrate probably plays a role too. I mean, I, I, I don't want to exclude the, the substrate, but I did want to point out that we have, we have a layer of glycerol on top of the dimers. Just Thank maybe you. add to the speculation here, could it be a, the reason that you do the calculation for a plane wave and the probing in the absorption is not made with a plane wave and the scattering probing is even different? I mean... Uh, Good question. I should, I should put David on this. I mean, he's certainly shown that he can, he can calculate the absorption spectra with a, with a focused uh, laser beam. Um, so, so yeah, I, it could be. But you're right. I mean, uh, we just used the most simple calculations in terms of me theory. Um, in this particular spectrum right here. Could be. Okay. Any other question? The last chance for today to ask Stefan. Okay. It appears that all uh, questions are for the moment satisfied. I mean, uh, of course, you can always contact the speakers if you want or watch the videos again because we have this beautiful uh, YouTube channel. So let me thank Stefan and Ilya again uh, for you. today's lectures. Beautiful, uh, nice work we've seen. And of course, also uh, mentioned that we continue next week on the 2nd of June with two talks by Mats Liebel and Jia Lung Si, and um, we hope to see you at, at that time um, again. Um, so, anything I should mention surpasses or? No, uh, I think that, that's enough. That's perfect. I didn't <laughs> forget anything. So, thank yeah. you very much again for joining us today, and see you next week, hopefully. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.